Um, the date here is off by a month or something like that. Sorry about that. Yes, so uh, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, once upon a time, uh, uh, 696 days ago, uh, a group of students, uh, they had to, to, uh, to do uh, a work as a kind of uh, assignment or whatever. And uh, I was one of the uh, mentors. And uh, But uh, the, the project turned out to be very interesting, uh, very feasible. In principle, in particular, sorry, the uh, most interesting thing is that um, this is uh, doable with uh, current technology, but uh, Anne Marie is going to talk about that. And this was published uh, again uh, on 2021. So uh, Marie will now introduce the technology and then I will go back to the, to the astrophysics. So Marie. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for letting me join the presentation. Um, I would quickly start with uh, pointing out again the advantages of building an interferometer on the moon. Um, most of the points you should have heard during the, the last days, um, but I will quickly repeat that. So on the lunar surface, we find a seismically very quiet uh, environment. There is no um, atmosphere and natural vacuum. And these are the main differences uh, compared to, to Earth. Furthermore, um, we have there uh, a lot of space to build a detector. We find a lower gravity than on Earth, which helps um, when it comes to building uh, suspension systems. Um, we find low temperatures, particularly if we go for craters uh, at the polar regions. And having an interferometer on the moon and interferometers on Earth, um, we very much improve the source localization with these detectors. And the, thank you, um, particularly interferometer, we, um, we sort of, we called uh, LIONS, so the laser interferometer on moon. And um, on the next slides, I will present here how we receive the sensitivity curves that you can see here. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so this is uh, the noise budget. Um, um, this detector would be sensitive uh, between 0 0.7 hertz uh, to the kilohertz regime. And it um, fully builds on technologies that are already available um, or planned for the third generation um, gravitational wave detectors. Um, so the, this is an all known technology. We only stressed um, the suspensions uh, numbers and the, uh, the test masses a bit. So these are the only changes from the known concepts. Next slide, please. Um, we saw that it uh, would be most favorable to build such a detector um, in a crater um, in the polar region um, because there we find a naturally low temperature. Um, there's geometry we need for such detector um, and we would have less solar radiation and dust. Um, we would like to have a detector in a triangular shape to measure radiation waves independent of their polarization. And um, our particular analysis um, has been done for the Shoemaker crater, which has a diameter of 50 kilometers, um, which allows for arm lengths of um, 40 kilometers. Um, and close by, uh, we would also have um, a mountain region, which helps in, in terms of uh, um, energy supply and uh, communication. Um, in general, one more thing that would be true for any crater is that uh, due to the very good vacuum on the moon, which is three magnitudes better than the vacuum in um, the LIGO detectors, um, uh, we would need no vacuum cubes. So we would only need to build uh, really the, the, the housings around the optics and then propagate the beams to, uh, yeah, to space. Next slide, please. Um, at Lower frequencies, we would still be limited um, by seismic noise in the suspension system. Um, however, this is a conservative estimate we made here. Um, we assumed the seismic to be a thousand times lower than um, the seismic on the surface of the Earth. Um, this relies on measurements by the Apollo missions. Um, however, these were, were limited, so it can actually be that the seismic noise is even lower than that which would mean that also the performance of the detector at lower frequencies um, could be better. The same accounts for the suspension system. 
um, there we assumed uh, test mass is uh, four times as heavy as in the um, Cosmic Explorer uh, proposal and a suspension system that is uh, three times as long. Um, this would then fit um, in suspension towers of uh, 11 meters of uh, height, um, which we assume to be, be doable and reasonable. However, this is also a question of uh, engineering in the end. So although this could be, be stressed in the end, achieving a better performance at low frequencies. Next slide, thanks. Um, about two hertz, we would be limited by, uh, by quantum noise. Um, to achieve this level, um, we implemented uh, squeezing, which is of the same level than proposed for um, Cosmic Explorer and uh, Einstein Telescope. Um, compared to the Cosmic Explorer, we decreased um, the power by a factor of five to achieve a better performance at uh, low frequencies. Next slide. Um, besides this noises, um, there are further um, challenges that we have thought about and which we not assume to, to limit uh, the performance or the general design, which are um, thermal noise. So we already find very low temperatures at the poles in the lunar, uh, in the craters at the lunar poles. Um, alternative materials would have to be used compared to the Earth-based detectors. However, there are already ongoing studies on that. Um, different to Earth, we would have uh, think about impacts of asteroids. Um, so a control scheme would have to be applied. We thought about some, some shielding. However, a direct impact um, at the detectors is where we compute it to be very unlikely. Um, a common problem on the moon is uh, dust. Um, however, there are also ideas how to handle that. And we assume that not to be a limiting factor. Um, regarding the power supply, I already said that there's a mountain region close by. Um, particularly for the Malapet mountain, it has already been shown um, that on that mountain, one would have 93% uh, of the time full or partial uh, sunlight, um, which is then uh, probably a very good place for building solar panels. And in addition, we would have lithium ion batteries. Um, also, the bandwidth connection does not seem to be a, a limiting factor. Um, however, we might lead uh, several launches to bring everything there. Next slide. Um, with that design, we would uh, achieve um, that sensitivity compared to, to other detectors. Um, we would have um, a nice overlap with the Earth-based detectors. Um, improving the angular res resolution by a factor of 30. Below 30 hertz, we would even be more sensitive than the current proposals for Einstein Telescope and uh, ET. Um, and we would even cover um, the parts of the sub-hertz regime. And they would like to mention again that this might be even better if the seismic uh, is actually lower um, and if the suspension system design would be stressed a bit more. Um, and now we're coming to the interesting question of what we could measure with such a detector. Okay, <clears throat> so um, they have uh, when uh, when they uh, we discuss about these things, that the first thing that they uh, try to look into was uh, as a first estimate how would be um, this interesting for uh, astrophysical sources, and uh, uh, in particular. Uh, um I I don't know whether this is uh, well known, but uh, for stellar mass binaries, I'm talking about the, for instance, stellar mass uh, black holes of uh, masses say of about thirty or ten, or this can well, not ten, because uh, that would be complete. Uh, depending on the distance, you might not catch them with Lisa. But uh, what is uh, not that well known is that uh, depending on the eccentricity, uh, Lisa will catch them or not. For instance, uh, if you form a binary with an initial eccentricity, I guess that you can see my mouse here, uh, with an initial eccentricity of uh, 0.998, which uh, might seem very high, but uh, it is not high if it's uh, formed dynamically in a uh, galactic nucleus or a global cluster. 
Then I am showing you here, of course, on the Y axis, you have the characteristic amplitude without any kind of dimensions, because you see how much you can stretch or expand the arms of the detector uh, divided over the other way around by the length of the detector as a function of the frequency. I am and uh, I am showing you here different uh, colored uh, curves. These colored curves correspond to different uh, harmonics in the uh, in the quadrupole approximation, which is basically analytical, if not uh, well, semi-analytical, right? And uh, I don't know whether you can see in uh, on, on your screen, but uh, I am showing you here different uh, moments in the evolution of the source. This is the second harmonic. This is why I have a two here. And uh, this would be 10 to the four years before measure. The initial eccentricity was 0 0.998, but uh, here it is still uh, of uh, 10 to the minus two, I think. A thousand years before the measure, a hundred years, 10 years, one year. This is one day. You can see the characteristic uh, evolution or acceleration in, in phase space of these uh, sources, as you can uh, well expect from uh, the uh, uh, associated uh, gravitational wave time scale, which is uh, proportional to the symmetry axis to the power of four. And then you can see that Lisa, for these kind of sources, uh, uh, it, it, she's, Lisa is not going to be able to, uh, to see or to hear them. Right, because the peak of the harmonics in amplitude is well below the sensitivity curve. Maybe, maybe some harmonics, but this is the dominant one. This is the dominant one, and uh, you see that it is not making it to the uh, this one. Still, uh, when I saw this, I realized that uh, this uh, configuration here you have Lion. This is this curve over here. Then you have the ancient telescope and LIGO as reference points. Okay, uh, Lion seems to be able to catch it at least uh, uh, the, the last uh, few milliseconds of the evolution. On the right, you have a different source. In this case, we have uh, this would be like a what? An intermediate mass region spiral, I would say. Two compact objects, one of mass 1.4, another one with a mass of 10. This could be like a, a neutron star with, uh, say, I don't know. Uh, uh, still a mass black hole, a mixed binary. Uh, in this case, uh, you also reach the detector. So uh, uh, this uh, configuration, this uh, well, uh, concept of uh, mission is interesting because it can catch a kind of decihertz source, which is uh, in principle completely out of the range for, for Lisa. If it's eccentric, if it's circular, then it goes up. Uh, Alberto, of course, Cesana has a paper about that. Now, what about massive binaries? Again, uh, this is showing the same concept. So over here, I am showing to you two black holes of masses 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 3. For simplification, I just set the masses to be equal uh, with, uh, say, a mild eccentricity of 4.9. And uh, this is the usual uh, source, which will cover all of the LISA range, starting at, uh, say, 10 to the 4 years before measure 1,000, 110, one year, one day, one hour. Here we have one minute. And uh, you see that uh, at about, uh, say, I would say this is like uh, 20 seconds before the measure, it is entering the, uh, the bandwidth of, uh, of Lion, of this detector. Over here, uh, we have, uh, this would be a real Imri. So this is an intermediate mass black hole with uh, a mass of uh, 3,000 with a uh, compact object, uh, stellar mass black hole with a mass of 10 solar masses. Uh, the peak of the harmonics is uh, getting into the least event, but the merger and the ring down is taking place in, uh, in Lyon and to also slightly touching uh, the Einstein telescope. Now, when I saw this, um, I decided to, to do a more dedicated, uh, say, investigation of the sources using more realistic um, waveforms. And this is what I'm showing to you here. Um, 
I am using waveforms from this uh, phenomenological uh, family of waveforms called the Iamire Phenom D. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a uh, lion in orange, again, as before. Uh, I am showing as well LIGO in green over here. In blue, with the characteristic wriggles, we have uh, Lisa. And I even decided to include uh, the Sego, although I am not sure of uh, when the Sego will take place, right? So look at the numbers. Uh, in particular, look at this. Uh, what is What color is this? I don't know. My, my daughter says that I am colorblind because for me, everything is blue, green. I don't know what this is. I guess she would say turquoise or something like that. I don't know. I'm going to call this blue. So look at this blue line over here. This blue line corresponds to a binary of uh, two black holes. The two black holes have the same mass of 100 solar masses. No, sorry, with a mass ratio, I was wrong, mass ratio of 18. The heaviest one has a mass of 100. So the other one is that divided by 18. Uh, at a relative of 100. So uh, this is the impressive number that I wanted to show, and this is uh, what I why, why I asked uh, Jan to, uh, to 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 present this paper because this is something unique in this uh, decahertz regime. Now uh, there are other sources. For instance, I'm showing to you over here a black a black hole, massive black hole with a mass of uh, 10 million solar masses, which would be. Uh, this uh, source here, not making it to uh, this is so that you can see how it escalates with the masses, right? So we have 10 to the same, 10 to the seven here, 10 to the four makes it way within the bandwidth range. And uh, this would be the kind of ideal source, right? 50 solar masses with a mass ratio of one. So this is 50 and 50, this curve here. So in this case, you would uh, get a slightly, a tiny little bit of a synchronous ratio maybe from Lisa, uh, but uh, most of it would be com coming from, uh, the, from, from, from Lion with uh, also contributions from LIGO. And this is very useful to have these uh, combined detections is very useful because it allows you to break the generalities in uh, when you want to extract parameters. Now, uh, over here, I have uh, two black holes of masses a thousand at a one gigaparsec. In this case, I'm showing you just uh, for curiosity as a kind of illustration, uh, the plus with whom. And for uh, two sources, one which is uh, perfectly circular and a different one which has a mild eccentricity. You know that uh, this, uh, well, this uh, 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 waveforms uh, do not uh, 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 accept uh, stream eccentricities yet. We do not know how to solve uh, the uh, intermediate mass ratio spiral in particular, but in general, uh, uh, I'm talking about the Sorry, I'm mixing concepts, but uh, I have a reason for that. Uh, the point is that uh, we cannot go up in eccentricity is very high with uh, this uh, uh, hybrid or uh, pure uh, numerical relativity waveforms. But still, just as, as an example, uh, if you take a, a, an eccentricity, a mild eccentricity of 4.2, you have the brown curve over here, and uh, the other one is completely circular. Now, the single noise ratio that uh, you are getting at uh, one gigaparsec is of about, uh, say, a little less than 2,000 for both cases using Enigma waveforms because it allows, in the case of the uh, of the slightly uh, eccentric uh, source. Now, um, just to see what is the role of the spin, uh, the family of waveforms, IEMR uh, Phenom D, allows you to play with the spin. And this is what I have done here, what we did, so in the paper. Uh, on the left, we have, uh, uh, yes, the uh, the massive, so, uh, the ma so the mass ratio is one, and I am showing to you the heaviest mass. So in this case, it's a thousand, 
in this case is 18 and the mass ratio is 10. Okay. On the left, this uh, binary is placed at a relative of one with a mass ratio of one, and uh, you get uh, all of this evolution. This is this uh, symbol here is one year before the measure, which means that uh, you can do with uh, Lisa because this is Lisa, and uh, in orange you have uh, this uh, lion concept. You could do well uh, multi man with uh, gravitational wave astronomy, uh, which is, well, this is something that uh, we already knew. Uh, I presented these uh, results with a student of mine in 2010. Uh, but this means that uh, if, uh, imagine that uh, Lisa and uh, this uh, lion detector would be operating at the same time, this would mean that uh, if uh, Lisa could see today this binary, uh, we could tell uh, people working on a, a gravitational wave detector on the moon the following. Listen, next year, on the uh, 19th of April, at uh, uh, 15 hours, uh, I don't know what, 35 minutes, 5 seconds, and a fraction of a second, you're going to have a system of uh, two black holes with masses such and such merging exactly at this uh, frequency, which allows you, you know, to readjust a little bit because you can play with the mirrors to uh, to readjust and to, to find the sweetest spot to uh, extract the most of uh, your detection, right? Uh, here I'm showing to you the same thing. In this case, uh, this binary uh, is. Uh, 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 just uh, uh, it's just detectable by uh, Earth, de uh, Earth detectors and uh, uh, Moon detectors. So this uh, is not there. Uh, uh, sorry, no. What I'm saying? Uh, well, I don't know why this is not there, but it should be there. I didn't see the blue curve, but it should be here. Okay, but basically it's the same thing. This is the same thing uh, for a lighter for a lighter black hole. Uh, binary. Now, signal to noise ratio contour maps. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, unique thing about uh, this concept, Lion or uh, 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 a similar gravitational wave uh, observatory on the moon. At least uh, we know that can reach uh, very, very high signal to noise ratios. This is a coral bar giving to you the synatonous ratio. The redder, the, the, the stronger, right? So uh, uh, if you are in red, orange, you are talking about a mass ratio, uh, sorry, synatonous ratios of uh, millions, if not tens of millions. And uh, here you have the total mass of the binary. So this is going to be uh, basically covering this range of masses. And uh, in the background, we see Lion. And uh, over here on the y-axis, I'm showing to you the redshift. So as I was uh, stating before, we can, we can make it to a uh, redshift of uh, 100 being uh, conservative with uh, interesting signal to noise ratios. As you can see, these blue colors uh, correspond to, uh, say, signal to noise ratios between 10 and uh, uh, say hundreds, uh, which would uh, complement in this regime to Lisa. And LIGO is over here. Okay. But the, of course, the advantage of LIGO is that it is operative now. So the dependence on spin, mass ratio, and uh, redshift as compared to LIGO is the same thing. This is a, a, a color map. Here I'm showing to you the synatonous ratio. This is a spin, this is the mass ratio, and uh, this is the redshift. Uh, well, the uh, comparison with uh, LIGO is, is probably it's not fair, right? Because uh, here we're talking about uh, much longer arms in the uh, detector, which is why we can reach uh, much, uh, uh, well, in my opinion, more interesting redshifts. Uh, 
And uh, you can see here the dependency with the mass ratio and spin, which is, is not uh, is not uh, it's not huge as compared with uh, with LIGO. The interesting thing is over here. So to sum up, uh, the uh, unique uh, feature of uh, Lion, the uh, concept which uh, whose uh, technology uh, Marie presented before, is that it is feasible now with current technology. So we don't have to wait for any new idea. The detection bandwidth is ranging between 0.7 Hertz and 10 kilohertz. A conservative estimate of the det detection noise floor is so of the order of 10 to the 24 meters per square root of Hertz at 10 Hertz, because we are not sure about uh, uh, lunar seismic, seismic activity. Uh, which was actually an interesting thing to, to do research upon uh, because I, I did basically not know anything about that. But uh, as uh, Marie said before, we were very conservative. We uh, tried to, uh, to not blow up the numbers at all, on the contrary. Uh, but still, with these uh, conservative assumptions, uh, it looks like uh, you can investigate the uh, uh, well, for instance, the formation of uh, supermassive black holes, which is an open debate, as you know. We, it, it is true that we have an emerging consensus about uh, the way that uh, supermassive, supermassive black holes form in the universe, but uh, it, is, it is debated, right? And uh, with uh, such a detector, we would have detections of uh, seed black holes out to a relative of 100 and beyond that number. Now, we can give an alert to Earth-based detectors and uh, LISA years in advance, as I said before, with fractions of seconds precision, which is uh, very important because, again, in particular on Earth, you can play with the configuration of the detector and uh, you know, adapt a different configuration so that the sweet spot moves a little bit to the place that is interesting for you. The in spiral of many sources will take place in LISA, while the merger and ring down will take place in Lion. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is interesting. And it's interesting because sometimes in LISA, uh, we are lost with uh, the degeneracy of parameters. In particular, uh, for instance, just to mention one of them, if we see uh, two black holes merging, two massive black holes merging, we don't know whether it was on this part of the sky or on the uh, diametrically opposed uh, point of the sky. So if uh, you had a detector measuring the first part of the evolution, which is the spiral, and then having a second one on the moon, like Lion, giving you information about the mass and ring down with uh, such high synchronous ratios as I was talking before, then you could break those degeneracies and uh, have, in principle, uh, the full, uh, uh, the full uh, information which allows you to extract or to do the, uh, the best science that you can do. And uh, in particular, uh, I would be interesting, interested in knowing about the uh, formation channels, because as I was mentioning before, for instance, uh, depending on the initial eccentricity, this thing is going to evolve in phase space in a very different fashion. So uh, I think this is enough. And uh, I guess this is uh, the end of the talk, unless uh, Marie wants to say something. Thank you both very much for this presentation. Um, are there any questions? Okay, uh, so you, um, this is a question that I brought up in my talk as well. Um, you you talked about predictions saying that, um, and you implied that a merger could be predicted down to the second. So um, has this been studied um, that in an early warning when you can, when you're 
projecting a merger out um, to a year from now or even a few months from now how accurately can you get the time of the merger yes uh, this is something that uh, i think but uh, i'm not sure about that we addressed in uh, our 2010 paper uh, this is why i'm not sure because we're talking about uh, 13 years ago uh, with uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a student uh, who was working in my institute, uh, Lucia Santa Maria. Uh, I think we estimated uh, the time window, but uh, I will have to go back and check. I, I know that I did the calculation. This is why I'm talking about uh, fractions of seconds, etc. Uh, but I don't know what the calculation is. Uh, it might be that I, I never I never published it or whatever because I didn't find it particularly interesting. Okay, so it should be ballpark seconds or something like that. Yes, I think so. Unless I did a mistake and uh, I, I, I do mistakes. Okay, thanks. Yes, Sashi. Yes, thank you very much for the interesting um, talk. Um, so I have two questions. First of all, um, so if I understand correctly, your laser goes through the, uh, it, it's not in the, like a tunnel, it's just go fly through the air, air, even if it's uh, almost vacuum. Is, is this correct? I could That's correct. It, but Marie case, is better. Um, do you have, um, what it will be the requirement for the alignment of two site? And how much are you um, affected by local topography or like a boulders distribution? How well do you need to know the local structure? Uh, you, you mean the, how, how the, 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 the surface on the crater is or? So um, it's very likely that um, when, once you land, you have sub-resolution boulders, um, sub-resolution craters. So, um, like if, uh, uh, how do you have robust design that um, will not be affected by such a local structure or how well do you need to know the local structure? So uh, we wanted to go in one of this, uh, this craters um, um, where we would Hope that there's nothing ongoing during during the time of the measurement. Um, we did not do a particularly uh, calculation of how the the surface structure particularly um, might uh, affect the measurement. However, I would assume it not not to have a huge effect since um, well, as, as long as as the beam does, does not hit the ground, um, it, it should not uh, have a huge effect. And did you also consider like um, dust levitation? Because um, I think in back in Apollo, we had some observation that at the surface of Apollo, there's some kind of dust levitation. And um, do you think your laser will be um, affected by such uh, dust flowing around in the air? Um, dust on, on the optics would be a huge problem. That's the thing uh, we, we thought about. Um, and there are ideas how, how to handle that. More um, between the two um, interferometers, in a way. Because you're going to shoot it in the air. And um, there is some observation saying that um, there is some kind of levitation of dust. So in the worst case, you might have a very thin layer of dust at the very close to the surface? Um, as, as long as it's um, on, on the surface, uh, it would not directly interact with the beam, only if it's the dust is in, in the air. That would then just mean that we have a, a little loss of, uh, of power. I mean, it, it, become, it becomes really crucial if it enters the optics. That's why we thought about that. Okay, thank so, you very much. So maybe if I can uh, make comments. So, I mean, uh, in, in, in LIGO, we have a very strong requirement on residual gas 
noise uh, because it's not only that you lose that you lose some kind of light you're also introducing noise so it generates a, a broad noise spectrum because of some random interactions between the light and, and and the particles so i think one has to be a bit careful that it's not only about losing some power of the light it is also about uh, that it's there, there's an introduction of the noise that happens so i think it would it's, it would be worth um, um, studying that a bit the, the other thing which was also connected to your first question is um, in, in ET, for example, we know that the tolerable slope of the beam with respect to the local direction of gravity is like one in 2,000 or something like that. That means like you have to be very, very horizontal uh, to the local gravity um, because if not, you are getting what we call vertical to horizontal coupling uh, through the suspension system because at some point a vertical ground motion starts to matter and then you are lost because you cannot really shield yourself very well from that. And so um, you have to deploy the two stations like almost perfectly at the same, you know, height. So you have to, that is like a, like, like a meter kind of precise landing that you need for, for these stations. So um, that was an interesting detail connected to your question, I think. Yes, Lois. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering what kind of suspension material you use. What are the um, fibers or something made of? If if I remember correctly um, from the proposal, um, we said that we might have to change uh, the material compared um, to the Cosmic Explorer design on, on which the model was based on. Um, I can't tell out of my mind if we proposed a particular uh, material or if we were just referring to ongoing studies. I think it was the latter. Yeah, so the, because uh, Cosmic Explorer, at least phase one, is then I think few silica. And if you go to, I think you said 70 Kelvin, right? That you deploy. Um, yes, yeah, few, few yeah. silica most likely won't be the best choice. Yeah, but if you do few silica at 70 Kelvin, then you have very poor because the Q uh, drops a, a lot there. And also, if you use silicon, then there's a slight dip exactly at 70 Kelvin. Uh, I looked up. I can. I put. A, I'll put a link in the chat. So you, maybe you, that's very unlucky if you really want to go for that crater uh, with that particular temperature, because uh, if you, yeah, you'll see in the it's figure one. So, uh, but. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. There's another question, last one. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, I just, from yesterday's uh, talk about the heating of crater walls, we know that the temperature cycles quite a bit as the sunlight lands on the uh, inner uh, crater walls. Uh, and also, the wall, if you're kind of close to the slope of these walls, there is always a chance of some stuff sliding down because it's continuously being heated and cooled with the solar cycle. Uh, I wondered if some thought has been paid to this uh, variation in temperature, and especially the heat load, because you have a very uh, non-uniform heat distribution around the uh, corner station and the end station. Uh, it would be very crucial to, to build the detector in a way that it's in a um, fully shadowed region because otherwise the, the temperature fluctuation would be would be too high. That um, So that's the, the crucial thing to make sure that we are not too close to the to, to the walls of the crater and to to be sure that we are really in, in a full fully shadowed region. Do we have a 40 kilometers of uh, line of sight within the crater? Uh, no. do we, or do we need to take the curvature of the moon into account on this? I, I, it might work. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I think this, this might work out, I think, for okay. the Shoemaker crater that they looked at. I mean, maybe not exactly 40 kilometers, but something yeah. you know, around think, that yeah. area might be possible in that respect, I guess. I thought you might need to uh, have the station a little above the ground so that you get a line of sight. But in which case you would become sensitive to the temperature. Okay, then uh, let's thank uh, Marie-Sophie and uh, uh, Paul again.
Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And let's move to the next talk.